Kitchen is a professor in Maynooth University Social Science Institute and Department of Geography. He was a European Research Council Advanced Investigator on the Programmable City Project and the Principal Investigator for the Building City Dashboards Project and the Digital Repository of Ireland. He is the co-author and co-editor of 31 academic books and co-author of over 200 articles and book chapters. He has been an editor of Dialogues in Human Geography, Progress in Human Geography and Social and Cultural Geography, and was the co-editor-in-chief of the International Encyclopedia of Human Geography. He was the 2013 recipient of the Royal Irish Academy, Academy's Gold Medal for the Social Sciences. Dr. Kitchen's talk today is entitled, The Epistemology, Praxis, and Politics of Urban Science and City Dashboards, which examines the conceptual underpinnings and practices of urban science and its application to the creation of city dashboards, informed by the building of Dublin and Cork dashboards. The research makes a case for a more critical framing and application of urban science that aligns with approaches adopted in critical GIS, radical statistics, and feminist data science. So Professor Kitchen, if you're ready, I'll pass things over to you now. Okay, great. Um, hopefully you can all you can all hear me fine. Um, I'm just going to share the screen. Okay, can you just confirm that you can you can see that? Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, just get that up. Okay. Yeah. So thanks very thanks very much for the uh, the invitation uh, to to speak to you today. Um, I'm, I, as uh, as Selena has already said, I'm going to I'm going to talk really around urban science and uh, city dashboards, and talk through um, the kind of the approach that we've been uh, taking to these, and that given uh, some examples of the work that we've been doing, and some of our arguments around how we think about uh, how we think about how we approach uh, kind of urban data, uh, urban studies, and un understanding understanding uh, cities really through. I guess the kind of the application of data data science in one form or, or another. Um, so I'm going to start with um, uh, talking about what 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 do I mean by urban urban science. Uh, so generally, this is a kind of a computational approach to city systems and the processes of urbanization. Uh, so it's typically using urban big data and data analytics. Uh, so things like data mining, statistics, visual analytics, modeling, simulation, and so on, uh, to try and identify causal relationships and predict how city systems will work, and to kind of come up with technical solutions to how we might fix uh, some of the urban problems that we uh, face today. Uh, now, typically, a, a lot of the a lot of the work in urban science has been going on uh, for people coming from kind of uh, data science, computer science, maths, physics, engineering, uh, and so on. But it actually builds on a much longer history of quantitative social uh, science. Um, so the work of kind of quantitative geography going back into the late 1950s onto geographic information science, really from the 1980s onwards. Again, urban modeling going back into the 50s and 60s, social physics, uh, urban science, uh, urban cybernetics, going back to uh, the late 1960s and 70s, uh, social ecology, urban informatics, location theory, urban regional uh, economics. So these have all been taking kind of quantitative, statistical, um, kind of mapping kinds of approaches to understanding uh, the urban. Uh, what's kind of new, uh, if you like, at the minute is uh, the use of urban big data and uh, and uh, data data analytics and machine learning uh, and so on. So the, the aim is to uh, conduct extensive analysis of uh, urban systems, to try and determine urban laws and produce new theoretical insights, to kind of develop a synoptic and integrative science of cities, and to translate that knowledge produced into a practical application. And it's typically contrasted with urban studies which uh, is kind of portrayed as conceiving of cities as constellation of places, as opposed to systems of systems uh, that uses more uh, quantitative data, but also much more qualitative data, uh, typically on uh, the quantitative is typically on the small data 
and it adopts a more kind of contextual approach with respect to politics, culture, policy, uh, and history. So it's often grounded in those. So it's grounded within a kind of more uh, kind of uh, social philosophical uh, perspective and is trying to contextualize within uh, kind of political economy, uh, cultural economy, what's been happening with various forms of policy, governance, legislation, urban history, uh, and so on. Uh, now, the, the epistemology of urban science uh, is typically rooted in a positivistic uh, tradition, uh, not, not unsurprisingly given where it's coming from. So it's applying, it's trying to apply scientific principles and methods drawn from the natural hard and computer sciences to social phenomena in order to explain them. So statistically testing relationships between variables, building models to produce and verify laws that explain and predict how systems work and to formulate uh, theories which can be uh, tested and uh, verified. And it's typically used in a realist epistemology. So this is, you know, there's an existence of an external reality which operates independently of an observer and it can be objectively and accurately measured, tracked, analyzed, modeled, visualized to reveal the world as it actually is. So it's taking the data uh, to be representative of what of um, of 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 phenomena in a in a kind of essential, natural, given uh, way, as opposed to a kind of constructed, produced, uh, generated kind of way. And there's typically three uh, epistemological variations uh, that kind of track what's going on with uh, data science more and uh, and uh, traditional science more generally. So the first is a kind of traditional hypothesis driven uh, deductive scientific method with the questions and approaches guided by established theory. You know, so we, we, you know, we come up with a, um, with a, with a hypothesis, which we then, which we then test with, with the data that we've got. And there's kind of an inductive empiricism in which data analytics are seen to be able to enable the data to speak for, speak for themselves. Uh, free of theory or human bias or framing. Uh, so this is, if you're familiar with the debates around this, this is kind of the Chris Anderson uh, version of science where you don't, you don't need a theory. You, you kind of throw various kind of analytics at the data and that will reveal the inherent truth of what the data has to say about the world. And the last is a form of kind of data-driven uh, science which maintains the tenets of the scientific method, uh, but it generates the hypotheses from the data rather than from theory. So you kind of do some kind of uh, uh, preliminary uh, data analytics, data mining, pattern recognition, and so on on the data to identify interesting uh, kind of relationships and patterns within it. And then you use those to, um, uh, to generate your hypotheses as opposed to starting with a body of theory working out hypothesis and then using the data uh, to test it. Um, okay, so, so they're the kind of the, the, the various ways in which uh, urban science is kind of being uh, practiced. Uh, so just to say something about the urban, the urban big data, because this is obviously key to uh, what's going on here in terms of opening up uh, new ways of um, finding out information about the city and being able to um, kind of monitor and track that. So one of the key things, I guess, about urban science is it's really interested in dynamic processes. So it's interested in uh, change and uh, practice and process and how cities are kind of evolving uh, and transforming uh, over time. And urban big data is very useful for this because it's providing streams of typically real-time data that provide a kind of a longitudinal uh, view of what's going on. Whereas in urban studies, typically uh, a lot of data will be snapshots at a particular point in time, often on surveys uh, or, or other forms of data capture where you, where you get a kind of a time slice um, on, a, on a small amount of, on a sampled uh, basis. Uh, so uh, big data is kind of different from small data in the sense that uh, it has velocity, so it has, uh, it's been generated in real time, and that it's exhaustive. So it's a sample based on an entire population within a system. So say, for example, within Twitter, it's, it's every single tweet as opposed to a sample of tweets. 
is is potentially what's there to be uh, analyzed and it's the same with the open big data so you potentially have every single reading off of a sound sensor on a continual basis rather than you know a sample of uh, a selection of um uh, of readings at a particular point uh, and so on so you have this kind of continual longitudinal uh, view and this urban big data is now coming off is now being generated across uh, all kinds of uh, domains within the city so within government we have e-government systems we have online transactions we have city operating systems performance management systems and so on when security and emergency services digital surveillance uh, predictive policing coordinated emergency response system uh, transport we have intelligent transport systems things like integrated ticketing smart travel cards bike share real-time passenger information uh, logistics management and energy we, we we've got smart grids smart meters uh, smart lighting and so on across the environment we have smart uh, we have a sensor network so uh, pulling in readings about pollution noise weather land movement flood management uh, and so on within buildings we can have an array of different sensors that are pulling information back into a building management system uh, within our homes we might have smart meters various forms of uh, app controlled appliances uh, and so on so, so basically algorithmic systems are being used to kind of monitor and track uh, what's happening within a within a particular system or domain and that and that's given us a uh, uh, kind of voluminous uh, uh, data sets that have uh, good granularity so this is the other distinction is is that we have very strong granularity here so the data is tied to individual sensors or individual swipe cards or individual phones or individual your cameras or whatever it whatever it might be so that's providing a massive amount of fine-grained uh, uh, detailed uh, information about various uh, urban systems uh, so this is like some of the data that we would have access to uh, this is actually all open data in in Ireland uh, that we pull into uh, our dashboards. Uh, so this is just some of the real-time mobility data. Uh, so I appreciate the, the, the table has probably got quite small uh, writing. Uh, so I'll just kind of uh, give uh, some selection of this. So it's on the left-hand side, we've got things like the transport, public transport GPS location. So being able to track the location of buses or trains or trams uh, and so on, or it might be the information that's going to uh, real-time passenger information that's being displayed on on the boards in bus stops and uh, train stations uh, we have travel time along uh, roads uh, so along road segments uh, we have inductive loop counters that are tracking the number of cars that are going over uh, over the loops uh, we have numbers of ca car parking spaces so the cars going in and out of the car parks and how many spaces are free uh, we have flight location flight arrivals departures we have maritime information about where the boats are. We have bike share information about uh, uh, how many bikes are in the bike stations and so on. And we have some uh, CCTV uh, feeds. And the temporal granularity of that data is, is the kind of, which is this kind of column here, is like a minute every, every few seconds, every two minutes, every few seconds, two minutes, less than a second, a minute, a minute, five minutes and so on. So this data is feeding in in a near in a near real time uh, basis, um, and it's allowing us to kind of track what's what's going on with transport across the city. And we we have another set of environment data. Now, nearly all the data that we have access to is just transport and environment data. We don't we don't have access into uh, some all those other domains that we were talking about, and that's one of the one of the issues around some of this data is access. Um, a lot of the data is held by uh, private vendors uh, rather than governments. And even when government has it, they're often reluctant to make it uh, open and to uh, give an API uh, onto this. One of our ongoing issues actually is with the APIs because they're constantly uh, failing. Um, and we're, so we're constantly having to update the system to try and um, uh, keep it working. And all of that data then is feeding back into uh, these kinds of control rooms and being outputted in various ways. So the one in the top uh, left here is probably the most 
uh, famous in terms of the literature and terms of what's been written is the control room in Rio. It was effectively built for the, uh, the Olympics and the World Cup and the Confederations Cup uh, as a way of kind of monitoring what was going on in the city um, and so on. It's pulling in data from uh, 32 different agencies and 12 uh, private companies, uh, the private companies being mobility, mainly mobility companies. Uh, and so it's pulling in data. There's about 400 people working in that control room on a 24-7 basis. Um, and they obviously can kind of monitor what's happening uh, and going on. Uh, there's a media section at the back where a journalist can kind of uh, sit and they can see what's kind of happening in terms of uh, various incidents and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So they, they can also kind of source stories from what's happening. Uh, city workers in the field also have kind of uh, devices where they can uh, ping data up to, to the center and also pull data uh, and analytics uh, down. Uh, the, the top middle one is a control center for a smart district in uh, Japan and uh, Tokyo. And you can see some of the, uh, the dashboard kind of analytics on the, on the screen and on the computer monitors in front of them. The bottom left one is the control room in uh, uh, Dublin um, and what the, basically what an operator sitting there sees. Um, the middle one here, I think is, in uh, Britain. This is, I think this is a control room to keep a single road operating. This is to keep the M25 orbital motorway around London um, flowing basically, uh, and to stop it con uh, getting congested all the time. And then some of this information then flows back out to the public through these kinds of uh, uh, dashboard kinds of interfaces, uh, um, allowing people to kind of see what's going on and then make decisions in their own lives uh, based on that. So this is, if you like, uh, urban science creating uh, data-driven urbanism and kind of managing and governing cities uh, in real time. And so one of the ways that we've been interested in this is, is uh, pushing this data out to the public and allowing uh, other, other uh, groups other than those people managing the city to see uh, what is what is going on? So these are just a sample of different um, dashboards, but there's a there's a whole load of them now uh, in in uh, different uh, places. Um, the work that we've been doing is on uh, is on Dublin and and Cork. Uh, so this is work from uh, initially the one on the on the left is from the programmable city project, and then the, the ones on the right are from the building city dashboards project. And they're quite different types of dashboards uh, in terms of um, kind of learning from the research that we've been doing. So the one on the left is the first one uh, that we that we built. Uh, this is just the top the top uh, level, and effectively what we did was just pull together all the data that we could find uh, for the city and various kinds of data analytics that other people were producing and that we were producing ourselves. And putting them in one in one place. There's actually 56 modules. So if you go down, if, you, if this is this is now disappeared, but when it was there, you could go down underneath each one of these, and you would find uh, various kinds of um, uh, various kinds of uh, 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 modules that would allow you to look at the city in in various ways, and it would also let you actually get the data. It would let you feedback. Uh, data, so this Dublin report, and allowed you to uh, upload information and data back to the city, uh, and and so on. So, and you can kind of get a sense from the titles. You know, how's Dublin doing? So, this is kind of indicators. Dublin near to me is kind of you know what what information is around me. Uh, where where's the nearest GP pharmacy, whatever it might be. Uh, some of the planning information, some of the housing, uh, some of the public administration data. So this is not real time data. This is uh, traditional kind of public administration kinds of data uh, and so on. And then over the last number of years, we've kind of transferred from this uh, to a more um, streamlined, uh, easier to understand, I guess, kind of um, uh, dashboard. And we've done quite a lot of work on this, doing uh, uh, kind of user requirements and testing and feedback uh, with people. 
uh, with different constituencies. So the general public uh, through to uh, kind of policymakers and people who would use the data through to kind of advanced uh, advanced users who maybe want to do their own analytics and design their own uh, way of uh, engaging with the data. And so in the top right, you can kind of see how we've we've reorganized the site. So we have a single kind of landing into the site, but then we have different routes into it depending on what kind of user you are. So we have kind of tools, tasks, and stories. So stories are aimed at uh, the general public. They don't need to know anything about analytics. They don't, um, uh, it's, it, they, they get the data and they also get a narrative that, that translates and explains what the data is showing. And so it kind of does some interpretive work for them. Um, the tasks are you trying to answer a particular kinds of question, and then the tools are for the kind of advanced user who wants to build their own um, kind of queries. Uh, now, the reason for doing this is what we discovered is, is that people actually have very low levels of data literacy. And what was happening on this site was, although there was a massive amount of data and a whole loads of different kinds of ways of displaying the data and so on, is people would land on the site and very quickly leave because they were kind of bamboozled by all of these various kinds of tools and having to learn how to use them and making sense of the data and not necessarily having the knowledge base of which to do that uh, and so on. Um, and what it made it very clear to us was is if we actually want dashboards that, that are going to be used by uh, the general public, then we have to find a different way of displaying that data and making it accessible uh, to them. So that's some of the work that we've been kind of uh, trying to trying to do uh, at this portion of the project. We've also been looking at how to push the data into 3D and a different type of environment in which to explore the data. So uh, I guess a kind of environment would be more familiar to people. So this isn't a kind of a 2D map base. This is where you can actually see the buildings and the roads and you can navigate them. So you can orientate yourself within the environment um, to an easier degree. And you can also display the data in a different kind of way. So you, you can take advantage of the third dimension uh, to kind of do 3D um, visual, visual analytics. So this is just some of the ways we've been uh, playing with this. I should actually update this because some of these images are quite old now. Um, so the top left up here is actually kind of Airbnb uh, data. Um, so I think this is uh, bike stations. Um, this is sound, the bottom left is kind of sound. The bottom middle is uh, land use classification and so on. And we've, uh, we've been doing this in VR. Um, so this is kind of an immersive AR where you can kind of see the, see the real world at the same time as you can see the data. And with WebGL, so this is kind of desktop kind of game space uh, kinds of um, uh, kind of uh, view. Uh, the other kind of way that we've been looking at doing it is using 3D printed models. So this is a, this is in the middle, I hope you can see it's a kind of a 3D printed model of um, uh, the, set, the central Dublin. It's a kind of seven kilometers by four kilometers. Uh, in size, it's about 59,000 uh, buildings on it. Uh, and then we're kind of hanging a data projector over the top and projecting the data down onto the model. And it kind of allows people to kind of walk around the model and talk about the model and kind of do maybe more kind of collaborative planning kinds of conversations than the kind of individual immersive uh, VR uh, kind of experience. And then we've been projecting different types of data uh, onto that model and looking at trying to create uh, data stories that might lead uh, people through. The model, the model on the bottom right is the, is the same model uh, for Cork. Uh, the model is about uh, four meters by uh, two and a half meters in, in uh, so it's two meters by three and a half meters in, in size. It's quite, it takes up quite a lot of uh, uh, floor space. Um, and it takes quite a lot of effort to align, given it's just a single projector going across that space to actually get the data to align directly onto the buildings um, is actually a little bit of a challenge, but is, uh, is possible. So we've been playing around with those. Now we were gonna do these big public exhibitions and uh, use the feedback on playing around with all this data, but of course, 
uh, COVID uh, kind of um, uh, killed any of that kind of work happening. So we're still waiting to actually show this to the public and try and get uh, feedback from them uh, as to as to what they how how they uh, think about them and whether they how how well they work at communicating kinds of information about about the city. Okay, so to think about these dashboards, what we've been trying to do is is uh, approach the dash dashboards in a kind of a critical kind of way and to um, and to kind of have a have a think about uh, what they're actually doing and the kind of science uh, behind them. Uh, so if I just start by by giving a, a sense of what I mean by a dashboard. So for us, a, a city dashboard is a way of kind of uh, being able to organize the data and allow interaction with the data. It's a kind of a cognitive tool that, Im that improves a, a kind of user span of control over what's actually quite a large set of voluminous varied and can be quickly transitioning data. Obviously the real-time data on our, on our thing is updating as the data update updates. So there's, there's actually an issue of being able to cognitively uh, track that. Um, it kind of enables a, a user to explore uh, the characteristics and structures of the data sets and to interpret uh, trends. Uh, and the kind of the power and the utility and why cities are interested in them is, is their kind of claims to be able to show in detail and in, often in real time, the state of play in cities, that they kind of translate the messiness and complexities of cities into rational, detailed, system, systematic, ordered forms of knowledge, and that they enable us to kind of know the city as it actually is through this objective, trustworthy, factual uh, data. So this isn't data based necessarily on, a, on opinions or sentiment and so on, although it can be if we were to include social media data, it's, it's data from sensors and from infrastructure and from systems uh, and so on. And what we've been trying to do is critically reflect on, on this. So in, in our work making, making the, the dashboards, we're, we're also kind of critically reflecting on, uh, uh, on, on kind of what's happening. Uh, and we're doing that in relation to kind of six issues. The first is in relation to epistemology. The second is around scope and access. The third is around veracity and validity. Uh, the third is around usability and literacy, uh, use and utility and ethics. And what I'm going to do is um, uh, go through each of those and kind of pose them as six questions uh, designed uh, to expose the kind of the politics and praxis of uh, city uh, dashboards. Um, and, and it can be used as a kind of heuristic to look at any other kind of urban, urban technology um, as, as well as a kind of six questions, kind of think about any other uh, kind of uh, uh, urban technology system used to manage govern cities. Um, so, uh, so if we translate the epistemology into a question about how, how are insights and value derived from uh, city dashboards, uh, we can kind of think about the, the kind of epistemological uh, approach to how they how they kind of work. So these dashboards are are relying on uh, visual analytics. They're they're adopting a, a realist epistemology. Uh, they they're typically uh, posing urban data as being kind of neutral, value free, objective, and uh, essential in in nature. That they that they're representative and they show they show the world as it as it is. Um. And when they're analysed uh, in a similarly objective way, they reveal the truth about cities. Uh, but from, from a critical data studies perspective, uh, data are produced, they're not collected. Um, so, you know, data are, are kind of constructed, uh, they're generated, there's all kinds of decisions made about, uh, uh, about how, we, how we collect the data, how we uh, process it, how we handle it, how we store it, how we share it. As there's all kinds of issues around how we configure the various tools that, that we use. Um, you know, even things like a set, like a sensor, which seems like it would be quite objective. There's all kinds of decisions made about where to place the sensor. Uh, so, you know, so if you place the sensor in the middle of a park or you place it next to a busy uh, junction, you're 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 making a kind of a political decision about what what you're measuring and how you're measuring it. 
Uh, there's all kinds of decisions about how you calibrate the sensor uh, and so on. So this is, these are full of uh, politics and full of praxis in terms of how they're, they're configured. They're not neutral, value-free and objective. They're, they're, they're constructed. Um, and they constitute a kind of a socio-technical assemblage, which I'll, which I'll show you in a second. And the, 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 the dashboards themselves are not simply mirrors of the world. They don't just simply show you what's going on. They kind of act as translators um, and as, as kind of engines. So they, they make things happen. Like decisions are based on what they display. Um, choices are made on what they display. Uh, and so on. So they they don't just display the world; they they actively do work in the world, and through and through that work, they change the world. So they're changing what you are measuring. So there is that kind of recursive, iterative loop going on. Uh, they're quite uh, reductive, so they they kind of atomize what are very complex contingent relationships. So they they pull out one measure or a couple of measures of things that are really quite complicated. So if, you know, if you're looking at unemployment or something, you might get one or two single measures of unemployment, but unemployment is a kind of a multi-dimensional uh, 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 kind of issue and, and has loads of different dimensions. And there's loads of things that, are, that affect why people are unemployed, why people stay unemployed, how people get jobs uh, and so on. And what you're getting is a very surface kind of analysis, which is decontextualized from the city. So uh, what you get is these kinds of uh, uh, kind of analytics on the right hand side without any history of, you know, so this one is average house price and rent and so on. You, you get that without any history of housing within the city or any of the politics or policy around housing or any of the kinds of ongoing issues that are going on uh, within that space. So you're, you're just, you're, you're given a very surface level uh, kind of presentation but not the material necessarily to interpret that information uh, in, a, in any kind of deep or meaningful uh, kind of way. And just to kind of illustrate this notion of, an, of, a, of a kind of a, a digital uh, socio-technical assemblage, you know, your, your set of sensors or your infrastructure and so on, you can kind of think of them as having two kinds of stacks. The, you know, the first one is a kind of a system process. So this is kind of performing a stack and you know, you, at the bottom of the stack, you have your infrastructure and your hardware, you have your operating system, you have your databases, you have your software, you have your interfaces and you have your kind of users and uh, uh, usage and so on. And decisions at any of these points changes what, what data is collected, how it's analyzed, how it's processed, uh, what's displayed, how the algorithms uh, work in terms of what they, what they produce and so on. And all of that is shaped by a context. So a kind of a context stack that frames the system and task. So systems of thought, forms of knowledge, uh, finance and political economies, uh, governmentalities and legal requirements, how organizations and institutes work, um, subjectivities and communities, how a marketplace works and so on. So even if we were just think about a finance, a, a, a dashboard funded through philanthropy money uh, is very different to a dashboard funded through uh, venture capital uh, in terms of what what kinds of pressures are going to come onto the development team in terms of what's happening with the data. The philanthropy one is probably not looking to monetize the dashboard or the data in any kind of way, but the venture capital one will be, and that will influence what kind of dashboard is produced, what kind of data is in it, and how it's kind of presented, and what, what actually happens to the data and so on. And then there are various kinds of critical kind of social science technology studies that actually focus on different parts of this stack, you know, so platform studies, critical data studies, software studies, HCI, uh, and so on, all kind of making sense of the kind of the politics and praxis around uh, this kind of a, this kind of assemblage. Um, and so the kind of, this is kind of led back into critiques around dashboards and critiques around urban science in general, that the approach is kind of, uh, it's reductionist, it's mechanistic, it's essentialist and just and it's deterministic. You know, it's collapsing, you know, diverse individual and complex multi-dimensional social structures and relationships into abstract data points and kind of universal formulae and laws. And 
you know, and kind of uh, uh, kind of overly simplifying all the kind of uh, complications and complexities and wicked problems that actually exist in, in cities, all the kind of competing uh, values and principles and objectives of different stakeholders uh, and, uh, and so on. You know, the critique again is like the data isn't objective, neutral and value free, but is kind of framed and situated in the kind of power geometries of knowledge and practice. Uh, a lot of these dashboards willfully ignore metaphysical aspects of human life. Uh, so, you know, metaphysical aspects would be things like values, opinions, beliefs, uh, and so on. Th these are measuring, typically measuring kind of factual information as opposed to urban lived experience and, uh, and kind of sentiment and so on. And they're kind of ignoring all the kind of politics, ideology, social structures, capital, political economy, culture, uh, and so on, that actually make cities what cities are. You know, if you're just going to measure the factual aspects of cities, then you and you miss out all of this stuff, then you're going to get a very surface level notion of what makes cities uh, function. And the solutions you, pr you produce will, will, will not basically work because they're, they're ignoring the things that make problems so intractable and difficult to deal with. So it's promoting a kind of instrumental rationality that, that, posits, that posits that cities can be effectively steered and managed through scientific insights and technical instruments, and that urban issues can be solved by uh, technical solutions, you know, as opposed to uh, other kinds of solutions, such as uh, political ones, uh, civil society, fiscal policy, legal interventions, uh, and so on. Uh, you know, rather than technical fixes. And in reality, urban science can contribute to uh, solving problems, but it does so by working in collaboration with those other kinds of fixes. Like you're not gonna, you're not gonna fix con uh, congestion purely uh, through a technical uh, fix. It also needs social interventions around encouraging people to walk and to cycle, uh, investments in public transit, uh, and so on. It's not, it's not going to be solved simply by optimizing uh, the flow, of, trying to optimize the flow of traffic on a, on a, on a network. Um, and so it kind of, you know, the critique is it produces a kind of limited and limited, limiting understanding how cities work. And it also, it also forecloses what kinds of questions can be asked and how they can be answered, you know, because it has a particular way of which it kind of looks at and thinks about the world, it, it closes off other ways of kind of thinking about the world. Uh, and I think part of that is to do, and this is a, this is a kind of critique that not just comes from uh, kind of me, because it's also coming from uh, some people within urban science who have that longer history within, uh, say, quantitative geography or quantitative planning and so on, that uh, there's a kind of constituency uh, that's maybe coming from data science or maths or computer science and so on, that just don't have the background deep knowledge of um, the kind of history of urban policy and planning uh, and so on. You know, so if you, you know, if you're coming at this from uh, data science and you've never studied urban geography, urban studies, urban history, urban governance, urban policy, any of those kinds of stuff, then you're, you're lacking critical domain knowledge that will help you make sense. So it's, it's important that the kind of urban science is done in a kind of interdisciplinary background where those kinds of knowledges can be added uh, to, to the mix if people, people don't have that. Um, I think that's a valid critique being made by people like uh, Mike Batty, who's actually one of the, you know, the leading lights in uh, urban science. Uh, then there's kind of questions around how, how kind of comprehensive and open are the dashboards. So these are questions about access. And obviously access is important because it's, it's also a question about power, about how, who, who has access to this kind of information, who can use it and what can they do with it and how that might change how the, how the city is uh, managed. So, you know, dashboard, dashboards are kind of displaying quantitative data. Um, there's a, there's a huge amount of information absent. So within a dashboard, you might only be measuring 30 to 100 indicators. And you know, that, you know, the, the city is massively diverse across every kind of domain you can think of. 
Uh, I've already said it's ignoring the metaphysical aspects and the kind of intangible parts of urban life. Uh, there's significant gaps and silences in the data displayed. Uh, a lot of the dash, a lot of the dashboards within those control rooms are limited to those control rooms. They're not available to the public, uh, and so on. There's various uh, levels of openness in relation to administrative data, um, and and we've we've had ongoing issues around access. It's a every, every, there's a certain amount of data made open and everything else has been these complicated negotiations to kind of leverage data out, out, out of institutions. And then even when we do get the data, then there's a whole series of other issues, I mean, relating to data measurement, into data formats and media, into uh, metadata, into data standards, into uh, ways of sharing uh, and so on. And pretty much all of the data that we host in the Dublin dashboard and in the Cork dashboard we can tell you nothing about in relation to uh, things like error and uh, bias and calibration, uh, representativeness uh, and, and so on. Now we've done a bit of work trying to, uh, trying to look at that and I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute, but it, it, it's difficult. The, the second is, is, is just assembling the data in places where there's a fractured political geography. Uh, so, uh, in some cities, you have very fractured data landscapes uh, with respect to uh, geography. So the kind of scalar organization between kind of local, county, regional, state, and federal. Um, you have kind of back-to-back -back services and planning happening across uh, districts. And you have a kind of a mismatch of functional territories versus administrative geographies. Um, so the, the maps on the right uh, kind of relate to Boston. Uh, the, the, the issue also relates to Dublin. So in Dublin, there are four local authorities make up the make up the city. They're all completely autonomous, and there's no there's no regional body over the top of them. So if you if you if you think about in you know, like smart city technology, it's quite possible for each of those local authorities to have a completely different bike share scheme, and the bikes to be not interoperable going between. Now that's that's not the case, but it's entirely it's in, it's entirely possible that will have that that could be the case, which would which, which would mean four different uh, data uh, systems. Uh, this is Boston. Now Boston's interesting because Boston is made up of 101 towns and cities, all of which are autonomous. So you have 101 planning departments, you have 101 school districts, you have 101 police departments, you have 100 you have 101 everything basically except for some infrastructure, which is shared. So some of the transport system, uh, some of the water and sewage systems are shared between uh, some of these towns and cities and so on. But it also means you have 101 open data sites if they have open data sites. And there's very little collaboration or sharing going on between uh, these, uh, uh, these towns and cities. Uh, so what we have here in the top on the top right is is actually the city of Boston, and you can see it's kind of got this loop out here, and this is Brookline, Cambridge, Somerville, uh, and so on. And the data for the city of Boston stops at the edge of Boston, as does the evacuation plan from the city of Boston. It doesn't go all the way to the edge of the municipality. Once you once you get to Cambridge, you're on your own. So trying to do a dashboard for for uh, uh, metropolitan Boston is actually almost impossible. In fact, it is impossible. Um, and so that's a that's a kind of a, this kind of fracturing effect is kind of interesting. And then we also have that in respect to stakeholders. So within municipalities and across municipalities, you know, you've got public sector agencies, you've got industry, you've got universities, you've got NGOs, you've got community organizing. You have to persuade all of them to share their data with you and so on. And they all have different goals, resources, practices, institutional structures, funding models. Uh, and interestingly, in the, in the Boston case, they also have different data ontologies. So how, the, how they collect and generate their data and categorize their data can be quite difficult. So e even if you had access to the data, merging them together is not in any way straightforward. We have the same effect in Ireland between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. It's extremely difficult to marry the data sets across uh, that political border uh, together to create all Ireland uh, data sets. And then there are questions around um, to what extent we can kind of trust the dashboards. So 
these are questions around veracity and uh, validity. So this is questions around uh, data quality. Uh, there's all kinds of issues here around human error bias, abstraction, representation, generalization. As I already said, the kind of the technical instruments have various specification, uh, various parameters, handling procedures, different scientific norms and standards, and so on. And a lot of the data is published without things relating to measurement, sampling frame, handling, veracity, uncertainty, error, bias, reliability, uh, and so on. So we've done quite a bit of work on this. So to go back to the the public, uh, the uh, transport data that I showed you earlier on, we've tried to assess that data uh, in relation to kind of veracity across kind of the source, the data and the metadata. So over here, we kind of have sustainability. So like, do, do we think this data set will still be in existence in two years time, five years time, 10 years time, 50 years, so on? How transparent or inter interpretable is it? Uh, issues around privacy, issues around fidelity, cleanliness, completeness, coherence metadata changes over time, uh, how standardized the data is, whether there's good methodological transparency, i.e. we know exactly how the data was generated, how it's been processed and handled, and it's kind of, and it's kind of relevance. And the way we've done this is basically to systematically play around with the data and to go and interview the people who produce the data, to go and go and talk to them. And you can see we've kind of got good, fair, poor, and not ready. And there's very few of the data sets here that have good all the way across. Uh, so there's some issue somewhere uh, with the data. That's not to say the data isn't usable and it doesn't produce useful insights. It just means that there are some doubts about the data in some respects. Uh, the other kind of issue is around things like uh, the appropriateness of the method and how the data is displayed. Uh, so the kind of validity of the analysis and interpretation, a lot of this stuff is black boxed. You, do, you don't know how, how the calculations have been produced. You just get the, the graph or the outputs from various kinds of analytics. And then how the data is actually displayed in terms of the visual analytics, you can get ecological fallacy effects. So this is the map on the right is an example of this. This is, this is exactly the same data presented at, at different scales. The top, the top scale is um, electoral districts. The middle one is enumerator areas and the bottom one is what's called small areas. So these are three different statistical geographies. It's unemployment and red is over 40% unemployed. And it looks on this map that the bottom, the bottom part of the map is, is red at the top. It's red in the middle and we can see some other kinds of changes going on, some kind of orange appearing over on the right and so on. And on the bottom, when we get down to small areas, so this is areas of 80 to 100 households, this is 300 to 400 households, and this is three to 4,000 households. And really, unemployment is really in this narrow strip that really bad areas. And this area that was in red on the top here is in blue. And dark blue is less than 5% unemployment. Now, if you're doing a targeted area initiative, if you're looking at this map, you put resources in this area. If you look at this map, you put no resources in this area. It's identical data. It's just been displayed in a different way. So how you display the data can, can lead people to have a completely different interpretation of what's happening in the city. And you can do exactly the same. We've been looking at kind of, um, so this is modifiable area. This is a spatial one. We've also been looking at uh, temporal. So how you divide the data. So if you, if you divide the data and display it, in kind of minute, in 10 minutes, in, in, a, uh, in an hour, in days, in weeks, in months, does that change what's shown? And, and, it, and it does, basically. Uh, and then there's questions around use, usability and literacy. I'm gonna skip over this. It's, it's basically that, that people find it quite difficult if, you don't, if you're not trained to interpret the information that's being um, uh, displayed. Um, and that obviously has, uh, implications because how people interpret the data uh, makes it makes a difference to how they act in relation to that data. Uh, then there's questions around how how these are used and their utility. So are they are they used in a very uh, strong direct way in terms of managing performance and so on, or are they used in a contextual way to kind of inform thinking and policy? In in U.S. cities, they're often kind of used in a very direct managerial way, whereas in European cities, they're used in a contextual way alongside lots of other information. 
So in some some US cities, you, you know, you have these purpose built uh, dashboard rooms. So this is one from Baltimore. They hold a weekly dashboard meeting where every head of a, of a service department is shown their data from the week before and asked to account for it and so on. So this is a very direct performance management uh, style of urban, of urban management and so on. Um, so there's a whole politics around, around that and what it, what it means to manage your city off of metrics and key performance indicators. And then there are another set of questions here around kind of ethics. Um, so, you know, can, can we assure that we can kind of use urban science and dashboards in a way that's, that's ethical? So we have very fine grained information um, on, a, on a kind of fine grained longitudinal basis. So we have individual level data on a longitudinal basis. This raises all kinds of questions around uh, kind of ethics and um, uh, kind of ownership and control of the data, how the data might end up in uh, data markets, uh, how it might feed into surveillance capitalism, how it might lead into social sorting, redlining, geodemographics, how it's leading into targeted area initiatives and where finance is invested or disinvested from parts of the city, how, how some of the data might end up in predictive profiling into anticipatory forms of governance. So this is kind of preemptive emergency management or in predictive policing and so on how the data might be used in other forms of governance. So things like nudge, so trying to nudge people's behavior to act in a, in a, diff, in a different way. Uh, questions around data security and cyber security and the ability to hack into these systems and disrupt them, but also the data to be stolen uh, from them. Uh, and then issues around control creep. So this is a system designed to do one thing, uh, starting to be used uh, for another. Uh, so an example of that would be things like the congestion charge cameras in London were, were installed on the basis that they would only ever be used for, for that purpose, but are now, of course, are used for, for regular uh, policing and security. Um, or the, um, or the, uh, the Trace Together app on COVID in Singapore that was uh, originally designed just to track um, movement for, for COVID basis. Uh, but a few months ago, the data from that app was used in a, in a murder trial um, uh, to kind of illustrate where, where the person uh, was on a particular day at a particular time. So data, data collected for one purpose was starting to be used for, a, for, another, for another purpose. And this kind of raises kinds of questions around kind of uh, technical procedural ways of thinking about this data versus kind of normative uh, ideological ways of thinking about this data. And... I'm not really going to go into this, but there's some really interesting work kind of going on within uh, data feminism, data justice, uh, and so on, comparing how we try to regulate technology, uh, which is often to kind of lo locate the source of problems within individuals and technical systems. So thinking about ethics, bias, consumer rights, fairness, uh, accountability, transparency, and so on as opposed to kind of rooting them in kind of structural power and uh, how society is configured. So thinking about them in relation to justice, oppression, citizenship, equity, and so on. And people, people like uh, Kate Rollinson and Rachel Franklin have been doing some interesting work around sensor networks and urban sensor networks and moving from kind of data ethics to data justice and thinking about uh, the justice kinds of issues around where those sensors are located, what data they're producing, who they're acting for, um, and how they affect what's going on within a particular area. And there probably needs to be more work done in urban science, data science, uh, you know, looking at, at these two sides of the col of, of this column. Like the the left hand side is typically how we're looking at this, and it's about compliance. Whereas this side is about kind of rethinking uh, kind of social relations and political economy uh, uh, and so on. Okay, just, so just to conclude then, because I'm kind of aware of the time. Um, my, my basic kind of argument really is, is, is there is a kind of a need to kind of reflect on the epistemology and principles and ethos of um, urban science. Um, Hopefully, hopefully it's come across that I'm not anti-urban science. I mean, obviously practicing, practicing uh, uh, 
uh, some of its methods and techniques and so on. Um, what I'm suggesting is a kind of a rethinking of the kind of the epistemology and ideology around, um, around uh, kind of urban science and really learning from debates that had taken place in earlier decades uh, in relation to GIS and statistics and quantitative geography, sociology, uh, and so on. So kind of learning from uh, you know, critical GIS, radical statistics, and kind of feminist data science, and really thinking around the politics and practice of what it is that we're doing when we do urban science. Um, so all of those still employ quantitative techniques, inferential statistics, modeling, simulation, visual analytics, but they're kind of mindful and open of their shortcomings. Um, and they kind of are very clear around their kind of positionality and situatedness of the researcher and the kind of the power uh, that's good, that, that is being exerted through them. You know, they're taking seriously questions around uh, data veracity, data politics, algorithmic power, uh, data ethics and justice, uh, and so on. And they're trying to make their analysis much more kind of contextual in relation to kind of history, culture, uh, and domain knowledge. And, and so there's a kind of a, it's kind of a, a, a different kind of version, if you like, of urban science. It's one that's much more kind of uh, uh, drawing on ideas from kind of critical social theory to kind of rethink how, how research is conducted and, you know, how we make sense of the findings and how we employ the, employ the knowledge. And it's much more kind of aware around the kind of how the city is contested, how it's messy and contingent, and that the and that solutions to the problems faced in urban societies uh, needs to be more than technical solutionism. You know, so, so urban science might be part of the answer, but it's not the answer. It's part of an answer with a, with a set of other related uh, kind of knowledges and expertise uh, and so on. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end at that point. If you if you're interested in any of this kind of stuff, there's a there's a few papers on the slides. I can I can make the slides available and you can you can kind of follow up on on some of those kinds of analysis. And um, I'll end uh, there. Sorry. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kitchen, for your talk. I would like now to open up the session for questions. Um, as a reminder, again, to ask questions, participants on Zoom are encouraged to use the raise your hand button. And I'll call you to my unmute and you can ask your question directly, or you may also type your questions in the chat box and I can read them out. Uh, and for audience in Avery 114, you can raise your hand directly and I'll call you so you can ask your question. Uh, okay, we have a question in. Yeah. Sorry, Stuart. Um, thank you so much, Professor Kitchen. I really enjoyed uh, what you had to say. I have particular interest in your discussion on data accessibility and literacy. And uh, you, you named a couple of really interesting um, methods in trying to improve literacy in, in these dashboards. I was just wondering in your experience, what has proven most effective by any standard of your metrics in, in, in treating that? Yeah, I mean, it's a shame that we haven't been able to do more, more user testing uh, af afterwards. I mean, COVID just basically killed, you know, really limited our ability to be able to, be able to, to do this. Um, our, our initial feedback, um, is is really around um, making making the data and its interpretation accessible to the right level. So, it, um, so for for members of the public, the, da the data stories approach is really about. It's almost like data journalism. It's about having the analytics and the story that goes with it, and and you're kind of telling a story. So we we have an example around housing where we kind of tell the story of housing in the city illustrated with these analytics that you can then you can query so all of our all of our graphs and so on you can kind of 
you know, you hover over them and bits of information pop up and, um, uh, and so on. But the text kind of tells you how to interpret it. Now for, 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 for policymakers, that's, that's useful, but they, they normally want to make their own interpretation and so on. And they want to be able to kind of query and ask questions of the data. We, we're not really, in the data stories, we're not really um, trying to enable people to ask questions. We're just trying to tell them a story on the, in relation to policymakers, we're trying to allow them to kind of answer, ask the questions that they that they want to that they want to pose, and to get some of the some of the information uh, back. Whereas our, our kind of power users, our um, our, uh, our our kind of um, uh, people who have a lot of background in data science or analytics, they work in GIS or they work in you know. Uh, a kind of a analytics unit within government or a company or something they, they want the utility to be able to kind of uh, do their own analytics and to and to um, you know kind of change how they query query the data and so on so it's really about trying to tailor um, what you're doing to different types of audiences um, my impression of most city dashboards is is that they don't do user requirements. They just simply put the dashboard together and then present it uh, uh, to you know to the to the to a public which is seemingly universal and uniform, as opposed to having these kind of diverse uh, kind of learning styles and literacies and and so on. So I, I you know I think it's just a you know if we're really going to do kind of public facing kind of geographic data science, urban science, then we have to work out a way where we can communicate to at different levels. And we, we, we're really not there at the minute. Uh, thank you. And I think we have a question in the chat box from Wednesday. Um, so thanks Rob for the presentation. I wonder if you could give some examples of what you think are situated contextual studies or projects in urban science. And I wonder if there is a way of formalizing methods towards this direction. Oh God, an example. Oh, no, of course I'm not gonna think of an example. Um, I'm trying to think of one. Um, System. I, mean, well, uh, I mean, some of the work that we, there's a there's a paper by kind of Jeremy Crampton and Co called Beyond the Geotag, and uh, in in that paper they 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 they're kind of doing their kind of Twitter analytics and they're doing analytics on other data and so on, but they're then trying to place the data within historical kind of context and policy kind of context, and they they make a case that that data has got to be complemented with kind of more localized studies, more contextually placed studies that, you know, you can't, you can't have a kind of a one size fits all uh, kind of analytics for every city that you have to kind of be cognizant of. So I think in that city, it might be about Louisville or something. And they're kind of saying, look, if, 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 you, don't, if you don't take account of the racial politics of that city, you're really not gonna understand what's going on there. If you just take the surface level data you know, you really have to place it into this longer history of deindustrialization, uh, very strong structural spatial divides within the city, uh, a persistent racial inequality, uh, uh, and so on. And you know, and if you don't, if you don't do that, you're really just going to give this kind of surface level uh, uh, kinds of analysis. And that's really the problem with some of these dashboards is that they are surface level. They're just giving you a kind of a, a, a kind of a general impression about what's uh, kind of going on, you know. And it doesn't really matter what the domain is, whether it's education or welfare or uh, transport or um, health or whatever it might be. If you if you really want to kind of understand, you know, if you really want to make sense of what's going going on, you, you have to link. You know, like the idea that you're going to be able to say something sensible about housing policy while ignoring the last 50 years of previous housing policy would, would make no sense, you know, like in terms of, um, you know, what worked, what didn't work, why it failed, what kind of politics were going on, what were the competing, competing ideas uh, and so on. And that if you want to solve the problems, then you're going to need a kind of a multi 
pronged approach onto that. You know, that it's going to need, um, you know, it's going to need different types of investments and different types of solutions, whether that's community, legal, fiscal, policy, politics, whatever it, whatever it might be. Um, I guess my trite, my trite answer on some of this stuff is around, you, you, you know, you're not going to fix, you're not going to fix homelessness with an app. You know, like it's, uh, it, there's no technical solutionist um, way of solving ho homelessness. You know, it's a problem of deep structural inequality, mental illness, domestic violence, all kinds of various things. The political economy of the city, the housing policy of the city, how rental markets work, how finance capitalism works, you know, how financialization and so on. Like that's, you, you, you need a multi-pronged way into that. Uh, an app, an app isn't going to do it on its own. Uh, thank you. We have another question from the audience on Zoom. Uh, this is from Ranjani. So as you pointed out, there are both benefits and shortcomings of using urban science in policymaking. What measures are cities or governing bodies taking measures to address these critiques of urban science? Um, I think I think the main one is is, a, is that mo, is that a lot of people working within cities are still cognizant that they need that they need this multi pronged approach, and that and that you know things like politicians are still reliant on on people to vote for them, so there's always going to be politics going on there. There's always going to be uh, kind of competing interests going on, different constituencies, uh, and so on. I mean, some of that's ad hoc and. Uh, happenstance and so on so uh, even within things like municipalities you've got different constituencies who have different uh, aims and objectives and 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 uh, will block uh, different kinds of things going on or or oppose them and so on so a, a lot of it is just the fact that cities are kind of complex social systems in and of themselves will will uh, lim will limit uh, kind of urban science being the only approach into understanding understanding uh, cities. In terms of like um, some of the kind of instrumental ways in which they're working on cities, you know, so things like implementing uh, predictive policing or various kinds of control rooms and, and so on. Uh, you know, so the, the kind of smart city technology, I mean, there's various pushbacks going on against that out of civil society, out of NGOs, out of out of political parties, you know, all, all kinds of people are kind of pushing back on bits of those, and um, and it, you know, interestingly, some cities are actually uh, decommissioning. So there's a there's a number of cities that used to have predictive policing programs that no longer do. They've uh, rolled back uh, from from that approach, uh, principally because they they they've decided it doesn't work, um, and it doesn't it doesn't do what they thought that it that it would do and it's you know it's very costly way of um of kind of reorganizing policing uh, services and so on um so, so yeah i you know I, I do get worried a bit around things like the data quality i don't i don't find people taking enough notice around uh the actual data that they're using and so on they test it i'm always surprised at how uncritically people will take data and use it without really uh, uh, kind of looking into what it is that they've actually got. Um, so yeah, I don't, I'm not sure I really answered your question, um, but yeah, I, I'm not too I'm not too worried in the sense of like uh, like urban science isn't taking over the whole thing. It's this like one approach amongst many. Um, and if people don't like the answers it gives, then they'll push back against it in any case. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Yes. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it's been really interesting. And I was just wondering, um, I was really interested in the, um, when you're talking about uh, the idea of like, there's, uh, spaces of silence and there's things that data analytic, like the data um, in these dashboards is not actually um, showing us. And I was wondering if you've experimented at all with ways to point to those 
silences or point to those blind spots um, on the dashboards themselves, if there's been any like particularly effective ways to communicate to users what is not being shown? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. No, we haven't, we haven't done that actually. Uh, and it's probably something that we should do. In, in, in a way, it's illustrated purely by the fact that there are so few data sets on, you know, so within, within any, say, say on some of our KPI indicators, you might only have three for education, four for health, five for transport or whatever. I mean, it's quite obvious in some ways that they're, that they're very limited selected uh, choices. Um, but we don't actually directly point out all the things that are not measured. I mean, we, we did some work, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this World, World City Council data projects, which is a, which is a kind of a global project uh, around the ISO uh, is it, uh, 37023 or whatever it is. There's a, there's a new ISO standard for city indicators. Um, and each city can apply to become ISO compliant around its indicators. Uh, now, we, we did the work for Dublin to look at whether Dublin could apply to become I ISO compliant around its city indicators. Now, to, become a, to be fully compliant, you, there's 100 indicators and you need, you need a certain percentage. Uh, in Dublin, we could, we could comply with 11 you know, that, that there were only 11 that would meet the ISO requirements. Uh, and the principal reason for that is, is that the data for Dublin is actually not at the city scale. It's at the regional scale. So it includes a lot of the hinterland that's outside of the city. Um, so it's not basically the spatial scale is the wrong scale. And that's kind of evident in our, in our, in our dashboard. What, we, what we're trying to do is do data that's at a Kind of neighborhood scale and so on and we just we have very little of it in fact mo most of the data we have at that scale is from the census which is every five years so we have a snapshot data as opposed to having continuous data and even things with like some of the real-time data that we've got they're really for small parts of the city so the, like the bike share scheme is really just the center of the city uh, the sound sensor network is just uh, again just really one one municipality out of the four uh, and so on so the kind of absences are kind of are, are kind of evident if you know the city and you're looking at the data but you're right it probably would be a good idea to actually to actually say it would be really great to have these kinds of data and these are kinds of data that, that are kind of um, missing I, I do get worried a little bit around the ways in which people try to find surrogates or proxies to fill in some of those gaps so like using social media data as a proxy for kind of value, values, opinions, beliefs, and so on, there's, there's huge issues with that, you know, um, not least that the data is just not representative, you know, like if you're, if you're scraping off a Twitter, you know, only 4% of people over the age of 65 have a Twitter account, like it's, it's not a representative of the whole population and the, the views that you're, that you're, that you're getting and it's the same whichever platform uh, that you're that you're using so it, it can't be a replacement for other kinds of civic engagement to find out people's views about the city it can only be a, a, a supplement uh, to it thank you thank you so much for that question um, and um, so on behalf of GSAP and the Urban Planning Program in particular, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Kitchen, for your great presentation today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your work with us. And also thanks to everyone who attended, both in person and on Zoom. Um, please make sure to join us next week at the same time for our next Lips Lecture by Professor Brandy Thompson Summers, whose talk will be on spatial temporalities, the future path of Black dispossession. Thank you.